Good evening. My name is Jonathan Mayer, and I'm pleased to moderate this evening's session on federal computer trespass law. Uh, before going into substance, I want to make a few prefatory notes. Uh, first, for those of you into the whole social media thingy, um, please use the tag CFAA uh, uh, so you can make your content discoverable and in turn discover content from others. We're going to have a Q&A with the, all the speakers at the close of the event, so we'd ask that you please hold your questions till the end. We'll be taking questions uh, both uh, from the live audience here at Stanford and from those watching online. Uh, if you have a question you'd like to pose to the panel, please go ahead and tweet it with that hashtag, CFAA, and we'll keep an eye on the questions that uh, seem to be most prominent, and we'll make sure they go in the hopper for the panel. Uh, if you have an actual legal problem, uh, please do not ask us about it. Um, <laughs> you laugh, but some people have already emailed us. Uh, please do not ask us about it during today's event. Uh, if you have questions about an actual legal issue, please reach out to Jen Granick at, at CIS. Uh, you can look up her contact details online. Um, and, uh, and handle it uh, not in this context. If you have a uh, smartphone or non-smartphone, uh, laptop, tablet, phablet, smartwatch, smart glasses, or anything else that makes noise, now would be a great time to silence it. Uh, we're not gonna ask you to turn it off because that would be ridiculous, who does that? Uh, and finally, a note of thanks uh, to uh, the, the wonderful colleagues here at CIS uh, especially Jen and Elaine and Amanda, who put together this event on, on such short notice, um, and also to colleagues at the Center for Internet and Soci or, or, I'm sorry, the Center for International Security and Cooperation uh, here on campus, as well as the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton for their assistance in co-sponsoring the event. So now on to the fun stuff. Roughly a week ago. I was sitting in my office in the computer science department thinking about how I would open this event. There was that subtle aroma of stale espresso in the air as it wafts down the hallways of the Gates building late at night. I, I don't recommend it. Um, lights twinkling, whether grad students on campus, otherwise dark. Uh, and, and the email came in between 1 and 2 in the morning. And all it said was test. That was it. Uh, and I wasn't paying close attention, I wasn't really sure what it was, so I figured, eh, some weird stuff. I'll go ahead and delete it. About five minutes later, another email came in. Someone asked to unsubscribe. Now, that was kind of strange. I, I didn't really understand why I was getting that, but okay. Like, again, junk, more important things to do. Delete it. A few minutes after that, someone made the observation that made it very clear to all what had gone on. The Stanford Computer Science Department uh, maintains a list, a mailing list, uh, that allows you to reach uh, the, the students in the department. And in theory, the list is only accessible to certain administrators uh, who have permission to email the student body, the over a thousand students affiliated with the Computer Science Department. Well, someone had changed the permissions on the list such that anyone could post to it. And so indeed, thus it began. Uh, in the following hours, uh, we accumulated uh, dozens of emails in our inboxes um, through around noon the next day. Um, an awful lot of clutter we heard from, just to name a few, Jackie Chan. Uh, we heard from Jules from Pulp Fiction. We heard from Simba. Uh, Stephen Colbert made a guest appearance, some random hamster. Jules from Pulp Fiction again, I guess he's popular. Um, and a cat said what we were all thinking. Now, it wasn't all just like funny stuff uh, or obnoxious stuff. Uh, some people saw this as an opportunity. Um, some people decided they were going to pitch their entrepreneurial endeavor to all of us in the computer science department, looking for a technical co-founder or an employee or looking for people to purchase some product or service, trying to figure out whether their product or service made sense. That drew this sharp rebuke in the form of a South Park meme. Um, I, I sure hope that no one actually had any luck. Wouldn't want to encourage that kind of marketing. Uh, and and you, you may be wondering, I mean, pressing national issue, uh, overachievers as always, yes, there were in fact 
two separate exhibitions of the Harlem Shake uh, that went out to the list. Now, the reason I think this episode uh, it was... Uh, the, the reason I think um, it, it's a great example for why CFAA, the statute we're going to be talking about this evening, is problematic, is because it's a microcosm of the various sorts of conflicts between the sorts of behaviors we might want to encourage, or at least allow, and the law as it may stand. Some students wanted to understand how Stanford's mailing lists work. Uh, they were doing some, some research, some digging into it. Uh, what happens when that sort of inquisitiveness comes up against a federal law that in its broadest reading would require a company's permission before doing that sort of research? What happens when students who want to be entrepreneurial, who want to go find others for their business or find potential clients or customers, come up against a federal law that says, no, you need permission first? The sort of people who see an open mailing list not as an administrative oversight, but rather as an opportunity. What happens, in a very real sense, when this tech culture that says, we don't ask for permission before we do things, we ask for forgiveness, and in many cases, we don't ask for forgiveness either, comes up against a federal law that says, no, you did have to ask for permission. And because you, if you didn't get permission, some argue, uh, not only may you be civilly liable, but you may have committed a crime. Now, it's not just the geeks who come into conflict with this law. Uh, it's also the ordinary, everyday user. So let me give three examples. Until not too long ago, it was a violation of Google's policies to open up an account if you were a legal minor. So as an entire generation of Gmail users, federal criminals, I would wager we have some in the audience if that's the case. Or what about Facebook, which has at times had a provision in its terms of service that says only you can use your Facebook account. If you borrow a friend's Facebook account, are you a federal criminal? Now, th these may seem like egregious examples, but they're actually not mine. These are examples drawn from an opinion by the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit. So for the non-lawyers in the audience, that's the federal appellate court that covers the western roughly quarter of the United States. And he gave a great third example from an online dating context, something I'm sure no one in the room is familiar with, but nevertheless, let me give the example, uh, where he suggested that describing yourself as tall, dark, and handsome when you're actually short and homely could earn you a handsome orange jumpsuit. So there's a fundamental tension between a law that says that and the way I imagine um, most people, again, not those in this room, could use these sorts of websites. But of course, there is a plainly legitimate role for a federal criminal and civil statute in dealing with computer trespass, addressing the problems that, for lack of better common jargon, we might term hacking, things that should come into conflict with the federal law. In fact, just this past week, we've seen loads of news coming out about media organizations getting hacked again and again, uh, potentially by entities that are state-sponsored. Uh, we've seen news about enormous tech companies, infrastructure companies, and others getting breached again and again. And there are some organizations that, at least some of you, have a role of doing nothing but breaching everything they can and extracting as much information as possible. And so, in light of these considerations, it does seem legitimate to have a federal statute. Indeed, it may be necessary to have a federal statute that gives the federal government the authority to investigate and prosecute instances of hacking. So tonight's all about these tensions. How do we accommodate technology research, technology entrepreneurship, technology culture, technology use as against a federal law? And at the same time, make sure that federal law covers the sorts of things that we do think should, in fact, be outlawed. So those are the tensions we're going to be covering tonight. Um, and our first speaker is going to be Jennifer Granick from the Stanford Center for Inter Internet and Society. Uh, Jennifer um, is the Director for Civil Liberties, a uh, leading expert on CFAA and other computer crimes issues, as well as a litigator. 
Uh, before coming to Stanford, Jennifer worked at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, where she was a prominent attorney on CFA and other leading federal cybercrime issues. And Jen's going to give us an overview of the law, where it came from, where it is now, and where it may be going. Welcome, Jen. All right, and my technological credentials are hereby established. I can work PowerPoint. Um, thanks to everybody for coming, and thank you to Jonathan for organizing today. Um, my hope in this event is that um, by having a conversation here with this community of people, that we will move further down the road than we currently are towards having an understanding of what an ideal computer crime regime would look like. Um, and, and that we will be able to better, uh, be, be better informed by the experience of innovators, of computer scientists, of engineers, than we currently are as we struggle with this issue of how to define the line between uh, be behavior we want to encourage, the gray area that maybe we don't know how to regulate, and things that ought to be crimes. Um, we have the opportunity to make this change because of something very sad that happened. Um, about five weeks ago, a good friend of ours and somebody who was uh, here at Stanford many years ago and who worked at Creative Commons, somebody who I met when he was about 14 or 15 years old, um, took his own life and he did so um, while he was facing prosecution under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act for uh, massive downloading of academic journal articles from the JSTOR service. Um, whatever you might think about whether what Aaron did was right or wrong, his uh, death is an opportunity for us to do something to make the CFAA better. Because of what happened with him, people have realized that there's a problem here and we have a chance to, uh, to fix that problem. Um, so while this event isn't specifically about Aaron or his case uh, or what happened in that case, what the alleged facts were, um, the fact of Aaron's prosecution and our loss of him um, informs and inspires the discussion that we're going to have today and hopefully any um, revisions and innovations we might have in making the law better. So, as someone who has represented uh, security professionals and uh, other kinds of researchers and coders for the past 17 years, I have bad news. Much of this activity is arguably regulated by a federal statute called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I will refer to it either as CFAA or Section 1030, which is the uh, section of the computer of the criminal code that it's in. And um, basically, the structure of this statute is uh, to require authorization before computers can be accessed. So it's a debate between that tension of do we ask for permission now or do we presume that we have permission and then access the machines. The Congress um, answered this question back in 1984 and then a major revision of the law in 1986. Um, and the structure of the crime was um, basically that whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization or exceeds authorized access has committed a federal crime. There's a bunch of different provisions, but these are basically the triggers. So there's a couple questions in understanding what the law means, and question number one is what does it mean to access a computer? And the federal courts took a very broad view of access. Um, and basically, if you look at the case law, uh, they said any kind of sending of information or communication of any kind with a computer is, constitutes access. 
So access was read extremely broadly. There was some question at that time of sort of a virtual, uh, in, sort of trying to understand the computer the way we understand like physical space and sort of these analogies. So if we uh, port scanned a computer and we just got back, okay, here's the services that are available, was that accessing or was that really just like knocking on the door to see if anybody's home? Did you have to dive deep into the data in the computer to really be considered to be trespassing? And these kinds of analogies between uh, the digital world and the physical world um, were promoted as something that would be a definition for access, but the courts eventually just rejected those ideas, um, and I think you can see why. It's very hard to draw those analogies because online communication is really quite different from the physical world, and so the court just basically, courts just took a very expansive view of access. What they said was that, while well, access is broad, we'll look to and interpret the issue of authorization more narrowly. And um, the, the statute did not define access without authorization. Um, oh, I went backwards. The statute did not define access without authorization. I suppose maybe Congress thought that that was self-explanatory back in 1986. But it did define the term exceeds authorized access, and it defined it in the statute as follows. Okay, so the question is, what does this mean? Back in 1986, maybe this made sense. If you think about what computers were like back then. If you were on a computer, you were probably at your workplace. Either, either you weren't allowed to use the computer at all, or you were at your workplace, or maybe you were a university student or something like that, and you had certain limited rights to use the computer, but you weren't really allowed to just rampage like crazy through the, um, through the system. And so in the legislative history, um, when Congress added the exceeds authorized access language, basically they said, look, we want to exclude outsiders. So we say if you don't have access, you're not allowed to, you're not authorized, so you're out. But we also want to make sure that insiders aren't allowed to abuse their inside status and abuse their credentials and uh, thereby get, take advantage of the insider status to get access to stuff that they're not supposed to have. So, in the narrow context of the kinds of ways we used computers back then, that might have made sense, but that whole scheme really doesn't have anything to do with the way that computers, the way that we interact with computers today. The World Wide Web was publicly introduced in 1991, five years after this statute was passed, and today there are probably 20 or 25 different computer systems that I interact with on any given day whether it's the cell phone or my social networks or my email or my car or whatever it is. And the, our relationship with these networks is very different from the um, relationship you might have had with, say, your employer's computer system back in 1986. These are default available for the public to use. Anybody can sign up for an account. Anybody can surf that web page. Anybody can make use of it. Um, and so the question in this world where we have so many more interactions with computer services that are offered to the general public is what does it mean to access without authorization? Um, and so uh, we had two uh, interpretations or two ways of looking at this term. Um, and one way was a very broad way and one way was a very narrow way. So the broad way is that um, your authorization is dependent upon the permission of the server owner. And the server owner can express their permission to you in many ways, one of which is through a terms of service document or other kind of, um, other kind of online click-through agreement, um, or through a contract, like when your employer has an employment contract with you that has a, and you have like an acceptable use policy for computers and you sign something there. Um, or even through just the general principles, tort principles of agency, um, meaning that you're authorized to do something so long as you're acting in the interests of the principal, the authorizing party, but your authorization ceases at the point in which you start to be disloyal. So we have cases that say that if you violate the terms of a terms of service, whether you clicked through it or not, um, that is a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. 
And this is a particular concern because terms of service often don't even rise to the level of enforceable contracts. Maybe there's no consideration. Maybe the person didn't actually have to click through and agree. Um, there's lots of situations in which we don't have terms of service that are contracts. We won't even enforce them as a matter of contract law, yet they can carry the weight of criminal law. And the terms in these terms of service, they serve the server owner and can be very um, much things that we don't want to be criminally enforced like Jonathan's examples about not um, overstating your attractiveness on your online dating profile, um, not sharing your, uh, your Facebook account, not um, using Google if you're under the age of 18. Um, the contract violation is very similar, usually comes up more in an employment context, but you know, even so, to go so far as to say that uh, disloyalty in computer use is a violation of the CFAA. We have cases that say that, that at the point in time when you're working and you know you're going to quit and you're accessing your employer's computer because you're collecting your contact information and you're getting together all your stuff and maybe you're writing your resume or while you're getting, or you're just goofing off because you know you're leaving in two weeks, that at that point you've lost the authorization of the computer server owner and therefore you're violating the CFAA. Okay. So the other point of view, um, and those, those holdings, those liberal holdings are in the Fifth Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, and the Eleventh Circuit. And the circuits are appellate courts that govern different regions of the country. Though that liberal view of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has been explicitly rejected in two circuits, one of which is ours here in the Ninth Circuit, which happens to be super large and goes all the way from Alaska down to the border and then uh, east to Montana, and then also in the Fourth Circuit. And in those cases, the courts were asked to confront this very same issue. Um, one of the early cases that was decided in the, um, in the Central District of California, I think, informed what the Ninth Circuit eventually did, and that was the case of United States versus Drew. Now, this case um, came about because a, I can't remember, I think she was in Missouri, a housewife um, made a fake MySpace profile and used a fake name, pretending she was a teenage boy, and via that account, a young girl was... Um, basically harassed and the girl ended up committing suicide. And there wasn't a state, there wasn't a, a law that really addressed that in the state court. So what happened was that a Los Angeles, a, a United States attorney sitting in Los Angeles, filed federal criminal charges against the woman who made the account, arguing that um, since making accounts and fake names violates the MySpace terms of service, that she was making unauthorized access to the MySpace servers, and that was a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and she was criminally prosecuted for that terms of service violation in the Central District of California. Um, the case, she was convicted, and the case was uh, reduced to a misdemeanor, and then the court, um, the court uh, vacated her conviction. But I think it was that experience um, something that we didn't think was going to happen, which was that there would be criminal prosecutions for terms of service violations that informed the Ninth Circuit when it uh, ruled in the United States versus Nozel case um, that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is not a data misuse statute, um, that it is an access statute, and that if you access something, you're not authorized to access. So an insider who's allowed to get sales data but not customer data or something like that, that violates the CFAA. But an insider who's allowed to get sales data but misuses the sales data by accessing it at home or sharing it with a competitor or something like that does not violate the CFAA. So those are the competing views of the statute. A broad one where policy violations um, about data misuse can lead to criminal liability and a narrow one that um, adheres to this narrower interpretation of the CFAA as really a trespass statute and not a data misuse statute. I think it's important to notice that one of the reasons why the law evolved this way is because the CFAA does have a civil enforcement provision. So many of these cases where this broader view of the CFAA was pushed and adopted were not criminal cases. But at its very um, 
essence, the CFAA is a criminal statute, and thus it um, has to be interpreted in accordance with criminal law principles. And since the criminal law is so onerous, the idea is you have to interpret those, those laws narrowly, not broadly. People need to know how to conduct themselves so as to keep themselves out of danger of prison. So given the circuit split, there is a chance that at some point in the near future, the Supreme Court will um, make an effort to harmonize the law across all of the United States and make a choice between these two different views of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act so that we have uniform federal law across all of the United States. There's another uh, possible venue for fixing the CFAA, and that is uh, Aaron's Law a law that has been proposed by Representative Zoe Lofgren um, in the wake of Aaron Swartz's suicide to change the definition of authorization under the CFAA to make it more concrete and to get rid of the problem of terms of service violations. And uh, there is a draft of this bill that's currently out. She published it on Reddit, and it um, hopefully will be introduced into the Congress, and we'll see what happens. But the important um, part of the bill is that it makes a change to the definition of access without, so without authorization. Basically, it gets rid of the exceeds authorized access language that um, caused so much confusion, and then attempts to define access without authorization uh, more narrowly. And this is the proposed definition. You'll note here um, about the circumvention of technological measures and the attempt to focus on, um, on accessing something you're not allowed to as opposed to misusing the data. And then the law is very specifically goes into what it does not include, um, and it does not include either of these alone or together. Um, so it does not include violating a contract or terms of service or something like that. Um, and it also uh, does not include efforts to prevent the identification of yourself or your hardware. Um, it's, the terms of service thing, I think, is also really important because I don't know about you guys, but I don't really have time to read all of those. You know, research has shown that if you read all the privacy policies that you encounter in a single day, that it would take you about 30 hours to do so, and that's just privacy policies doesn't even include terms of service. Um, I think that this... You, you, I think that the harder problem comes with trying to figure out how to define something that allows users to protect their privacy um, and that allows the kind of common usage that we make of computers all the time and also um, is a way of excluding outsiders or excluding detrimental uses of a computer server that we don't want. Um, in CFAA reform, as we struggle with figuring out a good definition or what the definition is going to be, this is the proposal. And Congress is going to debate it, and uh, if it gets marked up, it's going to change. And the question is, how is it going to change? How should it change? How can we make it better? What would make it way worse? And these are the questions that I'm looking to you guys to help me answer. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has um, been explicit that CFAA reform has to do three things in order to really address the main problems we see. One is it has to get rid of this violating terms of service thing. We can't have people doing prison time or being, um, you know, being uh, prosecuted for violating terms of service or contracts. The second thing is that it should protect people who are making innovative uses of information that they're already authorized to get. And here I'm talking about information that where copyright law doesn't apply, where trade secret doesn't apply, it's something that you're allowed to access and you want to do something novel with it. And this was really a hallmark in Aaron's case. He was authorized to access these journal articles. He wanted to download them really fast. He was going to do something with them. Maybe he was going to do research on them. He had already done one research project um, involving uh, looking at a uh, huge number of articles. Um, he's, but whatever it is, it's like if you're going to take the data that's not protected information that's out there and you're going to repurpose it and you're going to make a better service, you're going to give consumers something that's more useful, more effective, you're going to let them aggregate their social networking data, whatever that is, that um, if you're authorized to access that information, you should be able to do that. 
In other words, if you can download, downloading really fast shouldn't be a crime. And that's the idea behind principle number two. And then principle number three is really a proportionality principle that the punishment should fit the crime. And that one of the problems with the CFAA is even where maybe things are kind of borderline, if you violate it, the penalties are so high that they can really throw the book at you and it's really just too treacherous and dangerous. And remember, that's not just something that interferes with research, it's something that interferes with innovation as well. I think that the Aaron's Law proposal that uh, is out on the table now from Representative Lofgren's office does a really good job with number one and number two. Um, but we have come up with, as we are dealing with this question of what the law should be, a number of questions that are hard to answer and that we need help answering and that we need, I need your help answering. So what are those questions? Um, and, and, you know, if you have ideas about this or you want to uh, email me or we can talk about it during the question and answer period, this would be super helpful. Um, because I'm hoping that everybody here who's interested in this topic will sign up for our newsletter, that when we do things like we try to go to Congress and tell Congress we want to change the FAA and here's why, this is our experience of, you know, why it doesn't work for us, um, we, have some, we have people with real expertise and real experience who can inform that discussion. So let me ask you guys my hard questions. Um, what do you think about the code-based restriction? And, and if you like that idea, how do you define it? Um, what, what kind of code-based restrictions um, should be the, bear, be the line between criminal and non-criminal use and which kind shouldn't? What are we going to do about, um, about security flaws? Uh, are all security flaws uh, exploitation created equal or are some kinds of manipulations of computers okay and some kinds aren't? How do we draw that line? Do you guys agree about evasion of download rate limitations? Should that be a crime? What about other kinds of things that um, services do by identifying our computers specifically, like giving us um, differential pricing or targeted advertising or that kind of thing? Should people be allowed to evade that? And if so, how do we encode that and make sure that's okay in the statute? When we're talking about authorization, who gives authorization? Should it only be the computer server owner, or can I be the uh, can I give the authorization too if it's my data that's stored on that computer server? So one of the cases that really raised this issue was the case of Facebook versus Power, a case filed in 2008 that I think actually just ended. There, Power Ventures was trying to provide a uh, social networking aggregation service. And uh, you basically what you do is you put in your credentials and it would show you all your social networking data on a single page. Facebook didn't want them to do that and they sued them under the Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and under the state, uh, California State Computer Crime Law and they were able to stop them. Um, but if it's my data on Facebook and I want to get it off Facebook and see it in a different format, should I be able to um, give authorization for, to a tool to export that information for me and show it to me in a format that I prefer? What about password sharing? Um, if I share my uh, Netflix password or something like that, does that then become uh, unauthorized access? Is there a difference between faking your way into a computer system that you have no rights to and um, faking your way off a blacklist of a few people who aren't allowed to use a service that otherwise is generally available to the public? And if there is a difference between that and we want to make sure one's a crime and one's not, how do we do that? What about futzing with the URLs in a web browser? When is URL manipulation a crime and when isn't? If I see in the URL bar it says account number 123456, can I change that six to a seven and see if I get some other data? Um, and how do we distinguish that kind of uh, investigation from a SQL injection attack or some other kind of uh, thing that gets data out of the uh, server in a way that the server owner certainly did not intend. I actually had a case like this. I represented some um, people who were, uh, they were, um, basically they were, they were doing um, opposition research for their candidate and they just moved, changed the URL and they found all these hidden files of things that Arnold Schwarzenegger had said. And then finally, do we need a security researcher exception and if we do, what would that look like? So these are the hard questions that we're dealing with. I hope that people who have ideas or thoughts about this will contact me. And um, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this. And I'll be curious to see what you guys say during the question and answer period. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we're next joined by Alex Stamos. 
the CTO of Artemis Internet and an expert in computer security and forensics. Uh, Alex was the expert witness for Aaron Swartz's defense. Uh, he's generously taking some time away from a family vacation to remotely join us. Uh, so hopefully the technology works correctly. Okay, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am not a legal expert, so I'm going to preface that. Uh, uh, as Jonathan said, I was engaged by Aaron's attorneys to assist with the creation of their defense for Aaron. Um, and this is my first criminal defendant, actually. For the most part, our company works with large corporations who are looking to uh, protect their networks, either by finding bugs uh, initially before other people can can exploit them or by responding to attacks. And my run-ins with the CFA in the past have really only been in the realm of either research that our company has participated in uh, or more often uh, us doing incident response and creating reports that are then used to put other people in jail. Um, in fact, uh, no less a liberal lion than Amy Goodman called me somebody who normally protects Goldman Sachs uh, before asking me about Aaron Swartz. So, uh, you know, I'm not coming to this as somebody who wants to particularly defend uh, what Aaron did or, uh, you know, from a, a standpoint of free information. Um, but what the reason our company took this case, uh, and like I said, for the first time for a criminal defendant, was that we felt the expansive use of the CFAA was really not warranted. And that was just from a standard reading of the indictment. Even if you believe every single thing that the government alleged, and some of which were not true, but if you believed every single thing in the indictment they filed against Aaron, uh, you should you know, be very concerned about the idea of some of these specific uh, tasks that he, he undertook to, you know, to, to hit this final goal, that those specific things he did are actually very common kind of things that happen on the internet all the time. And I, I do recommend that everybody in the crowd read the indictment, um, because if, if you're at all involved in doing computer security research uh, or any kind of work where you are accessing remote cloud services over an API that's not documented or, or you know, stretching the bounds of what the API does, the exact same charges could be used in indictment against you. Um, and some of the specific things that were really concerning were um, the idea that misrepresenting yourself on the network uh, is wire fraud, for example. Um, and the misrepresentation they were talking about was that in, in some situations where, where Aaron connected to the MIT network, and I'll talk about the MIT network in a second, but in some cases where he connected with that, uh, they prompted him for a username or for his, his real name and his email address. Uh, they, they allow guests to get on it. This was a guest portal, something equivalent to when you go to a Marriott or use the, the Wi-Fi in, in an airport. Um, and instead of putting Aaron Swartz and, and his Harvard email or his personal email, he put in, uh, Gary Host and Ghost at Mailinator.com, uh, which, uh, you know, going to an airport and using Wi-Fi that you are allowed to use, but then putting in a fake email address so you don't get spam is the kind of thing that thousands and thousands of people do on a daily basis. Uh, but this was the one of the, the, the key allegations of the government that they, they wanted to throw the book at for him was that this was the misrepresentation of his identity to then access and protect the computer, yada, yada. Um, the, the MIT network I should talk about a little bit um, was also interesting in that my 13 years of professional security work, I've never seen a network that has been intentionally designed to be so open. And so a lot, you know, a after I, we, I had talked to his attorneys about this, after we had gone to MIT and examined the wireless network, examined the wired network, uh, and, and interviewed people from the IT department, uh, the thing one of Aaron's lawyers said to me is, I don't think this crime could even be committed. Um, and what he meant is the, the crime of exceeding access on the MIT network because MIT had intentionally designed a network that any guest who was physically on their campus could access a huge amount of information without any kind of monitoring or rate limiting or identifying of themselves. Um, they're also allowed and in some cases encouraged to assign themselves their own IP addresses and, and under questioning the, the MIT uh, folks admitted that a, a huge chunk of the, uh, pub, of the uh, public space that MIT has, that the, the 18 space slash eight, this huge chunk of internet space that MIT has, that a big chunk of it is not accounted for at any one time, that they're not sure what it's being used for because anybody's allowed to assign themselves an IP address at any time as long as it doesn't conflict uh, with other IPs that are being used. 
Um, and, and so as a result, you know, MIT creating this network that anybody can get on, anybody can assign their IP, the MIT is intentionally not monitoring it because they don't want to know what's going on, um, and they're intentionally not doing any kind of rate limiting. And then MIT signed this contract with JSTOR to make sure that JSTOR provided unlimited access to M any MIT IP without any kind of ID. Um, you know, MIT and JSTOR intentionally created a situation where somebody could go back to the buffet of documents that JSTOR provides infinitely and download many, many documents. And again, I, I don't defend exactly what Aaron did. Uh, in a blog post about this, I, I said that I didn't think what he did was courteous. I think it was uh, rude of him to utilize a network that was provided to him in this way. But, um, you know, I, a big part of this discussion needs to be if, if I'm allowed to do something, and I do so in a way that's perhaps a little too rude, right? If I go to a sizzler and they say it's all you can eat shrimp, and I ask for the shrimp 20 times, um, you know, is that a federal crime? Should I have a 35 years in jail he held over my head? Uh, and, and that's really the equivalent of what happened here, is that they, they created a situation where they expected this to happen, and in fact it happens on a regular basis. Um, and when Aaron crossed some kind of invisible line between what, what they thought was a legitimate amount of use and an illegitimate amount of use, uh, they decided it was a federal crime. Um, it, you know, in the end, I think what really angered MIT in the situation was Aaron physically going into an unlocked closet. Um, and I think MIT has a, a perfect right to disagree with that. Uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but that sounds like a, a simple trespass charge. Uh, and it, it seems to me that if you, if you really took the fact situation and you took that Aaron out of it, this person who's an activist, this person who had had his hand uh, slapped for his for downloading stuff from Pacer. If you just looked at this as a random person at MIT or, or an MIT student, um, there's no way that you can look at these activities and, and string this together and, and call this hacking um, or call this a crim you know, a criminal computer trespass. The, the thing that should have happened here is that uh, MIT should have called up the state's attorney and, and pressed trespassing charges and uh, Aaron would be picking up garbage in Boston Commons or something else, you know, teaching elementary school kids how to type to do his community service uh, and not looking at a, a life ending potential uh, federal uh, set of federal crimes. So uh, that's where we came from it. And, and from our work, you know, and initially we thought this was a silly use of the CFAA um, and looking at the evidence, talking to all the folks who were involved and talking to the MIT people who were pretty clearly the technical people were not very excited about this prosecution. Uh, it became readily apparent that uh, this was a, a massive overreach and something that could have been handled either privately um, or using uh, laws like, like the physical trespass into a, an unlocked closet. I, I should point out one of the parts of the trial that I was really looking forward to was the fact that the, the MIT police had put up a webcam in that closet to figure out whose laptop uh, it was who that was downloading all these files. Um, and while they're waiting for Aaron to come back to pick up his laptop, a homeless man uh, walks into the closet and stores his possessions in the corner. So we're, we're not talking about some kind of uh, super secure secret wiring closet here. Um, and it, as far as I know, that homeless man has not been prosecuted by the uh, U.S. Attorney Office in Massachusetts. Um, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's where we're coming from it. And uh, as a security expert, I think the CFAA is something that needs to exist. Uh, we do have to have the ability to prosecute people that overstep their lines. Um, but if, if we allow the CFAA to be used in situations where things like if somebody assigns himself an IP address on an open network and therefore it's a CFAA violation, or somebody puts in a fake email address into a form field, um, then we're encouraging companies to utilize security precautions that are not useful at all. Uh, and if you're paying any attention, um, the vast majority of work we do, and I think the vast majority of threat that's facing major U.S. corporations today, are not from uh, young people uh, attached to Harvard downloading too many files. They're from attackers who are either associated with foreign competitors or nation states who have, are encouraging them to, to do this for economic espionage. Uh, and in those cases, I think, uh, you know, CFAA is, is not going to be something that you can threaten people with to discourage them and relying on protections that are put in place specifically to trap people under an overly broad law uh, de decreases the security that all of us are relying upon from these cloud services uh, because certainly those are not going to stop hackers associated with the, the Chinese government or the Russian government or a 
Brazilian competitor of a major U.S. corporation. And that kind of stuff happens on a day-to-day basis. Um, and you know, hopefully we can get the CFAA to be reduced to mean something and to only be used in situations where uh, there's a real effect of discouraging attacks that harm people um, and can't be stretched in situations like this. So anyway, that's my theory. And I'll be around uh, later, hopefully during the Q&A, if people want to ask more questions about specifically what happened in Aaron's case. Thanks, Alex. Our next speaker is Brewster Kale. Uh, Brewster is the founder and leader of the Internet Archive, a nonprofit organization uh, that preserves books, websites, television, law, and I've lost track of what else. Uh, the Archive has had its own run-in with CFA, and I look forward to hearing about that incident, as well as Brewster's views on innovation in the law. Please join me in welcoming Brewster. I'm finding it pretty frightening to be a librarian these days. Um, Aaron, Aaron was threatened with 35 years in jail for being accused of doing something my library actively encourages. Actively encourages. Uh, Aaron Schwartz has worked for and with the Internet Archive to bring public access to the public domain. Much of the public domain materials we have been made available with Aaron were in database collect or, or collections that the, those that were um, serving those may have wanted to claim property rights over. So I find this all um, quite frightening. What I found out um, in the last several weeks is this prosecution and this stage of events was not an accident. It was a practiced and, and thought through action by three parties. And so far, none of them are repentant. There was a nonprofit library, JSTOR, that when it was being um, downloaded from, rose an enormous clamor to get it to stop when somebody wanted to survey the literature. MIT, an institution not as that distinct from this one, um, sprang into action and did things that I thought were way above and beyond. I went to MIT. Going on roof and tunnel tours were part of the tour of MIT. This wasn't hacking MIT. Ha hacking MIT was having high master keys and using them or picking locks, which was encouraged and taught at winter term. This is how MIT uh, works. Yet then MIT went after Aaron. And then there were government prosecutors that I find um, almost unbelievable. But what I found is this was not an accident. I talked with a government liaison uh, person that works for a major publisher, and he was excited and liked the law. And Because I, I thought this was kind of a mistake. I mean, how could any of this make any sense? Didn't JSTOR make a mistake, MIT make a mistake, and the prosecutors? Turns out, no. None of them think they made a mistake. Um, and the, he liked it because it gave federal prosecutors, they could get the federal government to go after people that were downloading public domain databases from them, or elements of public domain materials. I find this quite frightening. It wasn't an accident. What Aaron did with the... Um, what the Internet Archive is something that we encourage everyone to do, to read, do research, download documents, and data mine them. The Internet Archive crawls websites all day long, every day, and we have for 16 years. We archive every web page we can get a hold of, and then we make it available through the Wayback Machine. It's used by about 500,000 people every day. It is a record of our times. We work with the Library of Congress, the National Archives. We work with national libraries all over the world. This is what it is we do. Yet Aaron, by going after some of these um, materials, ended up in a very different uh, situation. We got dragged into a lawsuit uh, between two people, they were mad at each other, and they were using the um, the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine documents as a uh, component in their lawsuit against each other, and they were just mad. Um, and this goes on actually all the time. We're not that fond of having lawyers use us, use us to sue each other, but uh, that's that's what it sometimes happens. And 
what happened in this particular case is one of the guys was kind of mad that we even had the document, so they turned on us and said it was uh, a... Uh, they brought us into the lawsuit um, because we crawled their website and got publicly downloadable materials and, and made them uh, available. Um, the, uh, it, they ended up settling, but it was incredibly painful. So, so an organization like ours has no defenses. We don't have lawyers on staff. So if we get sued, which, you know, suing librarians is sort of bad form, but I'd say it's a bad form to go and serve Sue and Aaron Schwartz as, as well. Um, we had to go and, and actually uh, Stanford and others helped us in our case pro bono um, to be able to deal uh, with being dragged into uh, such a lawsuit. They ended up settling, but the level of pressure that we felt even as an organization is really high. The idea of a single person getting um, dragged into a lawsuit and then being brought in and being pushed on by the federal government, I'm not sure we have any real understanding of what that uh, kind of pressure uh, comes to. But it is um, really bad. So I only have a micro inkling of the sorts of pressure that would have pushed a principled young man or led him to be disillusioned, disaffected, depressed, and commit suicide. Um, some of the projects we did, let me just go over them just to sort of say what is it happened. PACER, there's a, a government do, uh, database of public domain materials um, that was legal to access from a library. Aaron went and downloaded a lot of these with our friend Carl Malamud's support and, and then uh, with Princeton University after the fact going and doing a, a, a service to go and, and, and take these documents as they're being downloaded by users, and we uploaded them all to the Internet Archive. And we made these available for free um, to people. And it's 800,000 court cases, over 4 million documents that have been used by over 6 million people. This is good, right? This is uh, something that uh, we think, as part of our public service, it's what we're here for. Yet, um, Aaron, for going and doing this, was trailed by the FBI, um, and they went and staked out his house in Chicago. So, so there's something going kind of wrong. Um, there's, we wanted to set up and inject books, deep books, into the Internet. The Internet uh, and the World Wide Web has got a fairly thin set of what all the information out there. You kind of think of it as the library, but if you know something deeply and you look on the internet, it's often not there. You, you bottom out. So what, how can we go and inject books into all of this? So we wanted to at least make a website that had a catalog of books and encourage people as things became available to make them available. It's openlibrary.org. Aaron was the lead programmer and architect of this site using some of this technology that he sold to Reddit, and uh, it actually worked quite well, but it in involved going and getting library card catalog records, and you'd think that librarians wouldn't be, you know, that possessed of these. Wrong. Um, so going and getting large collections of these and making them available on the Internet Archive was just part of our job. And so we got sets of these materials from uh, libraries that were willing, and we integrated them and, and put them up. And now, I, I don't know, after listening to Jen, I'm kind of worried about being a librarian and cataloging books. Another example was the Google Books um, case. There's Google uh, worked with a bunch of libraries, including Stanford, to digitize a lot of books. A lot of them were public domain. Um, they were available on Google's website. They didn't say that they were anything other than public domain. Yet they put up technological measures to keep you from downloading them. If you wanted to download one or two, you could do that. If you wanted to download 100, they'd turn off your IP address forever. This is great. This is public, there, so it's not public, real public access to the public domain. It's like having the national parks, but with moats and walls and gun turrets pointed out for anybody that might want to go into a public park. Um, so we started seeing books being uploaded to the Internet Archive from the Google Books collection. And then faster and faster and faster and faster. And it turned out it was Aaron again. So Aaron had um, uh, worked with a bunch of his friends to go and slowly download books from multiple places to go and slowly go and download about 800,000 of these books and upload them to the Internet Archive. So as this started to happen, it's like, wow, what do we do about this? It's like, 
well, let's help. And so we, uh, we made sure the metadata was right. We made sure that the, the links pointed back to Google's website. We ran it through optical character recognition so that people could search and data mine based on these uh, collections. Um, and to their credit, Google didn't complain. The libraries did, though, which is a little spooky. But um, there's starting to be a theme here. But what happened to Aaron in the JSTOR case was not an accident. Um, he, he was just doing again what it is, we, I think, what we'd seen him do uh, before. He'd gone and downloaded a lot of literature from Westlaw to make it available for data mining as a project here at Stanford. And it, uh, out came a paper going and delineating the effects of funding of law school research and publications, uh, what you'd think of as a, a valuable thing to do, and in fact very much in cutting with the times, that basically libraries are becoming increasingly digital and our users are becoming increasingly computers. Academic research is often being done now with the aid of computers to do data mining and, and that such a work. Open access is now a growing trend within academic publishing to make things available so they can be data mined. Open data is now a government uh, programs are now springing up to do open data work. Aaron was very much in touch with the times. He was going in the direction that all of us really are going in, yet he ran afoul of concerted efforts by some libraries, some universities, and some of uh, federal prosecutors to try to stop. So these terms of service issues, we violate them all the time. They're sort of leftover legalese that people put to cover their ass on their websites. And we're no different. Um, these things are very difficult to change. You put in as much draconian stuff to cover the organization's butt, and it's uh, uh, made available. So what is going on now? It seems that, well... Due to this, almost everything is illegal in that Soviet sort of way. Everything's illegal, except you just, only when they want you do they start to pull you over and deal, deal with you badly. Um, but data mining is not a crime. Down, bulk downloading in and of itself is not a crime. These laws are not with our times. We need to go and encourage good actions by good organizations by making clear-cut laws, and thank you very much for helping um, Jen in, in this work and what's going on as an open discussion around how do we go and make it so that the next bright young people that come up to do interesting and novel things are not put in jail for a long time. Thank you very much. We're next joined by Ed Felton. Uh, Ed is a professor of computer science and public policy at Princeton University, where his research focuses on computer security and privacy. Until recently, Ed served as the chief technologist of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, unfortunately, doing, due to a travel logistics snafu, uh, Ed is not here in person, so we're go giving him the Skype treatment as well. So give me just a moment to get that set up. Okay. Um so I'm sorry I couldn't be there with all of you. Uh, this is a topic that I'm passionate about, and um, uh, I very much wish that I could talk to you uh, in person. Uh, but things being what they are, I'm uh, here in New Jersey. Um, I want to sort of echo what Brewster said and talk about um, how the extent to which the activities that folks like I do are, uh, are uh, becoming more and more like a... Uh, uh, a, a sort of legal minefield. Um, my students and I for a long time have worked on security analysis of uh, all kinds of, of devices and, and software. Typically, um, not as much uh, analyzing things that you connect to across the network, but uh, looking mostly at uh, objects that we own and have in our lab. So we've looked at um, the security of desktop systems, we've looked at um, Things like uh, the DRM and uh, um, and compact discs. Uh, we looked, for example, uh, quite a bit at the uh, Sony compact discs that turned out to be installing spyware on people's computers. Uh, and we've looked at things like voting machines. Now, all of these uh, share uh, uh, some characteristics in common. These are technologies that we either own or um, have borrowed and are using with the permission of the owners. Um, 
but we're using them in a way that the manufacturer of the technology, there's some company that's involved that, that, that um, they, will not dis they will not approve of. Um, to give one example, our work with voting machines. We've um, had three or four different models, makes and models of voting machines in our lab. And we've done quite a bit of security research and found uh, all kinds of pretty serious problems with the security of these machines. And that, of course, makes the vendors very unhappy. Um, and this is where things can become legally complicated because even though uh, we feel that we're very strongly ethically in the right, uh, experimenting on these machines and asking questions that are of public import uh, and doing it on machines that we have lawfully acquired in our own lab, um, nonetheless, uh, there is a tendency of the laws around uh, computer attacks and uh, similar situations turning into a situation where it becomes legally dangerous to do something with the computer that's skillful and makes a powerful person angry. Uh, and in fact, you can sort of tell the story of Aaron Swartz's case in, in, in exactly those terms, that Aaron did something that was um, skillful with computers. He downloaded documents faster than other people would have been able to or than some other people would have been able to. Uh, and he did, um, and he did some technically skillful things um, in the course of doing that. And of course, he made someone who had some legal rights angry. Um, and so, even research like our voting machine research, uh, where we had done our legal homework carefully, uh, we could never be really fully certain that we wouldn't face some kind of claim under the CFAA. Now, we were fortunate in that these technologies did not have click-through agreements that you had to uh, click when you booted them, turned them on. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to agree to terms of use in order to vote. Um, but nonetheless, there we were in our lab um, studying these technologies and deliberately circumventing the technological protections that were on them. Um, I, I want to also follow up on um, a, uh, uh, a point that Brewster made about the impact of uh, a legal threat or a prosecution on, um, on an individual. Uh, because I've been sort of on the other side of that, not as the threatener, but as uh, someone who has faced legal threats from powerful entities while working in a large institution. Um, about, uh, about 10 years ago, um, my colleagues and I were threatened by the recording industry over some research that we did about uh, DRM technologies uh, on compact disks. And uh, we, once again, had been fairly careful to make sure that we were on the right side of the law. But nonetheless, the threat came. Um, and what we learned is that although there are certainly advantages to being embedded in large institutions, there are also a lot of disadvantages when that kind of legal threat comes uh, from being in a large institution and being uh, integrated into an institutional fabric. Um, we had uh, done a collaborative research project that involved people at three or four different institutions, each of them large, traditional, and conservative. So Princeton University, for example, my employer, this is uh, certainly an organization that understands academic freedom and is willing to stand up for it. But nonetheless, it's also an institution that has very deep pockets and is, by its nature, uh, cautious. Uh, and so we had to do a fair amount of convincing in order, to, uh, understand, in order to get folks to understand how what we were doing really connected to the core mission and values of the university. But it wasn't just Princeton. There were other, other employers involved. Uh, and the legal threats came not only against us, the seven or eight co-authors of this paper, and our employers. They came also against the uh, people who were involved in the peer review of our paper, the chair of the program committee for the conference, and his employer, which turned out to be a part of the U.S. government. Um, the, uh, the legal uh, fallout spilled over even to the... Uh, uh, even to the uh, university, Carnegie Mellon, that was hosting the conference where we would have presented our results. Uh, and so, uh, although we had plenty of people who uh, could and did come to our aid, we were also uh, felt that we ended up dragging a lot of other people and institutions um, into, uh, into a very complicated situation. And ultimately, we had to be cautious ourselves because of that. Um, you can't really appreciate the 
amount of disruption and chaos and headache that a legal threat can bring. Uh, and that's what happens when you win. Uh, so from my standpoint as a researcher, from my standpoint of uh, someone who, like Brewster, uh, cares a lot about, um, about making sure that information can flow, making sure that people can discover what's going on and talk to each other about it. Um, I think it's super important to make sure that we draw a relatively bright line, that the line is easy for people in, in the field to understand and control, and that it doesn't give quite so much, uh, uh, quite so much discretion to prosecutors or to people who um, can hire a lot of lawyers uh, to decide who they're going to inflict pain on. Um, my experience in research is that you can do a lot uh, if you have a lot of good legal advice. And uh, I'm incredibly grateful to uh, all kinds of lawyers who have given us volunteer advice, including some at Stanford and, and elsewhere over the years. Uh, but really, without that kind of support, um, I think it would be difficult to do what we're doing. And I know there are quite a few people who are scared off from doing applied security research just for this reason, that uh, they feel it's a legal minefield, um, and there's a sense that in recent years it's been getting worse. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. Where he works on computer security and privacy issues. In a prior life, he worked in the technology industry uh, focusing on security. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking CIS and Jonathan and Jennifer for organizing. Uh, it's an honor to be here alongside people who've accomplished so much. Uh, so as Jonathan, Jonathan said, I work for a staff as a staff technologist for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. For those who may not know, we're a digital civil liberties group that defends free speech, coders, and hackers' rights, among other things. As an organization, we've brushed up against the CFA quite a bit. We've been involved in several cases, and we're currently helping Andrew Orenheimer, also known as Weave, as he appeals his recent CFA conviction. That was a case that happened this fall. Just wanted to uh, quickly mention that. Uh, furthermore, in addition to casework, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, we're actively working on CFA reform efforts right now. And I encourage everyone who's interested to visit our website, EFF.org, to learn more about that effort. Uh, I should also emphasize that I'm not a lawyer, and uh, Jonathan's earlier disclaimer about if you want legal advice, I will say don't come to me. Uh, I will run away from you. I can't give you legal advice. Um, so when I first found out about the CFA, I had the same reaction as I do to lots of computer laws, which is to say, wow, this is really vague. I, as a technologist, I, you know, I, I understand different aspects of technology and how computers work. And then when I read the law, it just sounds like this kind of gobbledygook general language that I can't really grasp. Um, but after learning about cases and threats involving the CFA, I've become convinced that the vagueness here is even more pernicious than usual. So as Jennifer mentioned, and I'll just quickly rehearse, the central point of unclarity of the CFA centers around this idea of authorization. Um, the, the statute states that one cannot access a computer without authorization or in a way that exceeds authorization. Um, and as she said, Congress uh, chose not to define that. Um, you can imagine that this leads to a lot of ambiguity, and case law so far hasn't helped much to clear it up. So what's the effect of this vagueness? Um, well, generally speaking, vague laws are bad because they give prosecutors an incredible amount of power to go after who they want. Um, and they can effectively decide who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. This is really dangerous in a world of emerging technology where the norms are still being decided. Uh, we don't want them to be decided by prosecutors. We want them to be decided by us. Um, and more pointedly, computer use is an area where we want to encourage innovation. And as Ed said, we don't really have bright lines right now. And not having bright lines makes people afraid to do reasonable things. Um, so the sorts of activities that are chilled by the CFAA, I think, is kind of the topic of discussion today. And I, I kind of see what we're doing as a brainstorming session where the community thinks hard about what needs to be protected but's under threat by the CFAA. 
Uh, there's a lot to cover, and I think we're only scratching the surface right now. So Brewster talked about the importance of data mining, and um, Ed and Alex spoke about security. Ed spoke about uh, kind of academic research and the importance of uh, protecting the importance of protecting those institutions. I'd like to focus on a different sort of activity, which is kind of more broadly speaking, tinkering, hacking, uh, and security and interoperability research on remote machines. So not things that you own right in front of you, but but web servers that you communicate with. Um, and after exploring that somewhat thorny topic, I will. And in the spirit of brainstorming, suggest that authorization might not be the best conceptual framework for a good law that protects innovators while punishing criminals. Um, okay, so what is this kind of tinking, tinkering, hacking, and security research on remote computers exactly? Um, Jen said that as opposed to when the CFA was passed in 1984 and 86, where you might access one computer per day, she accesses 20 to 25. I think if you use a web browser, the, the real figure is closer to thousands. Um, every time you visit a website, your computer is sending requests to dozens or sometimes even hundreds of, of servers uh, just with a single load of a web page. Um, and so I think this area is incredibly important to think really carefully about and to get right. So some of these activities are quite obviously innocuous, I think. Exploring a URL structure by changing paths and parameters just might be a way to help better navigate a website. If I'm, you know, if I see uh, question mark page equals two and I want to go to page 17, I'll just type 17 into the URL, URL bar. I think no one would, could possibly suggest that there's anything wrong with that. Moreover, security is sometimes so brittle that you can accidentally or trivially stumble upon a serious security hole. Uh, if you, you know, for example, sticking with the same example, if you have foo.com slash a slash something, you change it to foo.com slash b slash something, and whoa, there's a bunch of protected material. Uh, that's obviously, you, you weren't even trying to, to break any security, you were just curious if there's another part of the website. Um, this is kind of a vacuous example, but there are also just incredibly weak or ill-conceived access schemes that effectively provide no security. Uh, and from a technical standpoint, it seems hard to convince myself that, that it's some sort of weak circumvention of such a scheme uh, in and of itself should lead to any sort of criminal prosecution. So getting the easy examples out of the way, uh, there is kind of beyond small changes and accidental testing, but there's kind of bona fide testing where you're really testing someone's remote server. You're trying to find a flaw. Uh, maybe the server's running an insecure version of PHP or is vulnerable to a SQL injection attack. At first blush, it might be tempting to dismiss this activity as rogue hacking, which we have no societal interest in protecting. protecting. However, if we do a bit more careful analysis, we might come to a different conclusion. Computer security thrives on an environment of open testing. Cryptographers in the second half of the 20th century eschewed secret schemes in favor of open ones where everyone has a chance to crack it. Only when the community has openly tried and failed can we feel that a technology is truly secure. This lesson extends to computer security generally. The most secure scheme isn't going to be protected by law. It's protected by open testing. Uh, security research and hackers researchers and hackers who discover flaws in software and disclose those flaws so that they can be fixed make us all safer. The same is true for server mis misconfigurations or other security issues. If flaws get discovered and fixed, that makes the company and its users' data more secure. Some companies and organizations are kind of very receptive to this point already. Uh, we have tech projects at EFF.org. If you find a security vulnerability in one of our projects, for example, our browser extension, HTTPS Everywhere, tell us. We want to know about it so that we can fix it. Um, unfortunately, other companies lag behind. And in some cases, it's often cheaper in the short term to dissuade security research with legal threats uh, than it is to appropriately budget for and deal with security issues. Similarly, companies might want to dissuade interoperability research and testing to maintain a monopoly over a certain technology. We must champion the value of open testing and disclosure, since it's, this is really beneficial to the public. Discovering flaws and fixing them should be encouraged. Norms around security research are still developing, and the decision to make an activity illegal 
uh, sh- has to be made with these new norms in mind. So having talked a bit about the kind of uh, security on other people's networks, uh, I, al- I want to now turn to the topic of authorization. And in particular, I want to suggest that uh, framing the legal boundaries of what is allowed behavior around this notion of authorization might not be the best approach. So authorization invites analogies to physical trespass law, but there are very important differences. As Professor Oren Kerr points out, CFA is a criminal law, and the principles of interpreting criminal statutes are very different from those of interpreting common law statutes. Moreover, whereas the norms around physical trespass go back hundreds or thousands of years, um, the computer world is brand new. Physical trespass and theft are very different. For example, usually when you steal something, you steal it only once, and it's obvious that it's gone to everyone. Uh, With computers, you can steal data infinitely often, and you can do so completely surreptitiously, um, so that it's not obvious that something was stolen, at least uh, on the face of it. Uh, So, yeah, if a server is insecure, users' data can be vulnerable to, to malicious actors, and I think testing a server and demonstrating an attack are defensible activities. This is especially pointing if it's your data that's being stored on the server. You have an interest in checking it out and seeing if, it's, if your data is really being protected. Um, in short, I think computer behavior is new and analogies to the physical world shouldn't be guiding the legal theories here. Second, and more importantly, authorization implies that the owner of a server should have control over how that server is used. This cuts against the creative nature of the internet, where people can use and augment services in creative ways. Skype, used twice tonight, and other peer-to-peer protocols, for example, cleverly route around firewalls. Imagine if the the vendor of a router were able to block that technology through a CFAA threat because the router was being used in a way that wasn't authorized. A just law and code of ethics should be shaped by technologists, security researchers, and those who recognize the value of innovation that the success of the internet comes from the fact that you don't have to seek permission or authorization to do things. I think many people in this room share this set of beliefs about innovation, and I hope you will leave this event with the idea that you have a responsibility to make a change and fight for sensible computer crime law. Once again, thanks to CIS, and if you'd like to learn more about CFA or get involved with uh, our efforts at the EFF, please visit EFF.org. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So I'd like to invite all the speakers to come up to the the panel. So some people wanted to know my contact information while we wait for them to come online. You can get to me at jennifer at law.stanford.edu. And if you do have legal problems and you're writing to me because you want some help with those, you can write that to me and that I consider that to be, that is attorney client privilege. You're looking for help. And it, I will either help help you find the right person to talk to and refer you to somebody, or if it's something I can handle, maybe I will help you with it. So that's a way to get in touch with me if you actually have something. uh, That's the place and the time to get in touch with me if you have something specific about your own experience that you need to discuss, or whatever. So jennifer at law.stanford.edu. All right. Uh, so, so uh, to start, I want to take moderator's privilege briefly uh, and, and, and ask the first question. Uh, and that is, uh, in thinking through how we architect federal law for criminal offenses or civil offenses, the, the usual thing to do is you start with some set of behavior you want to prescribe, some problem out in the world, and you match up, uh, match up the, the law as against that problem. And so the question I would ask with particular... Uh, I'm particularly curious to hear from the security experts, um, both here and online. Um, How well do you think CFAA does at preventing exactly the sorts of intrusions we're really concerned about, the stuff we hear about in the news all the time? Um, Dan, do you want to take a first step? I can take a crack at it. Um, So... I think that, as I hinted at, this idea of authorization being the the key component that defines the line between what's legal and what's illegal seems kind of conceptually wrong to me. I I think of 
the activities that should be disallowed as having a, a, some sort of malicious intent. Um, and I, I think that you're, so you sweep in a ton of legitimate activities if you uh, kind of have this idea of authorization and if it's not narrowly enough defined, narrowly defined enough, which I think it, in the current case it's not. So I guess that's my first order answer is that I think that it presents a big problem right now because we aren't just limiting the activities that we want to stop. We're also limiting a bunch of legitimate things. Alex, uh, you, you of course are an expert in computer security. You work with businesses in securing their systems. Um, what role do you see for CFAA in preventing the sorts of attacks we hear about? I'm sure it does have an effect on some users, um, on some people who, attackers who, who might go out. But, but honestly, the percentage of people who are regularly attacking businesses who fall under the uh, reasonable umbrella of the CFA is actually quite small. Um, the, the only cases that I've been involved with where uh, prosecution has definitely happened was one uh, a situation with a, a social network where the attacker was in a, a Western country, a strong ally of ours, uh, and therefore was prosecuted there under their equivalent of a CFAA. Um, another situation was a uh, some bad guys who broke into a uh, large, uh, medium-sized financial institution who were in Latvia, um, who, where generally they would have been outside of the reach of the U.S. government, but were tricked into traveling to the Netherlands to pick up a check at a Western Union, uh, and therefore were, were picked up uh, and brought back to the U.S. and prosecuted under the CFAA. So it, it definitely does happen. Um, you know, none of the situations that we've been a part of have we been able to trace it directly to um, and somebody in the U.S. with the ex exemption of insider attacks. But generally, the insider attacks that we deal with are not anything I would call hacking. There are uh, the disloyalty kind of things that Jennifer were talk was talking about, and they're covered under other laws or most likely taken care of civilly um, and, and not prosecuted under the CFA, even if that's used as a, as a weapon. So, I mean, the CFA is important. I think we need it. Um, I think the idea of, you know, if we got rid of it, would it double the, the danger American businesses are facing? I think that's highly unlikely. The, the vast majority of danger people are facing are aren't folks who, or their governments either tacitly approve or look the other way when these kinds of attacks happen. Thanks. Uh, all right, so let's take a question from the audience. Okay, hi. <clears throat> Mike Doherty from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, while I appreciate the CFAA as being um, the top of conversation here, the, is, is not the larger goal here to look at what really happened to Aaron and and the behavior of the uh, DOJ and the prosecutors that cho chose to exploit the loophole in this law so that while with the Congress that is even passing a Cybersecurity Act right now and a White House that upped the petition level to get the dress once this went up from 25,000 to 40, now 100, when we had the petition to have the DOJ person addressed. Um, what would you propose we do to, ch to um, make the behavior of these uh, investigators more accountable? Because I don't know what the path of least resistance right now is, but getting laws through Congress seems like a rather long, um, unlikely short-term solution Whereas putting the real transparency on the behavior of the Department of Justice in any law and the games they play and the way they bully people like Aaron is maybe might look uh, more unlikely, but maybe another more short run solution to the overall goal we're trying to achieve. Um, I'll, I'll answer that. I was a criminal defense lawyer for about nine years before I came to Stanford in uh, 2001. And um, 
you know, I think that the number one thing you can do to limit prosecutorial discretion is to define the laws narrowly. Otherwise, we are always dependent on what prosecutors think is the right thing. Um, there are other things we can do about the conduct of criminal justice in this country, other things we should do that we must do that would affect a far broader uh, number of people than the people who use computers. I mean, if you are a student of the criminal justice system, you see these problems every day. But the problem is not easy to solve. Um, it involves training, it involves supervision, it involves how rewards are given to prosecutors for doing their job. Um, it's complicated and it requires lower sentences, it may require decriminalization, and frankly that seems to be uh, even bigger problem than CFAA reform. I think it's very important. I think hopefully one of my hopes is that um, people in this community will become interested in criminal justice reform and interested in the problems of, of, uh, of that part of our society and will um, become active in that as well. Um, but it is not a easily tractable problem by any, by any means. Let's take another question from the audience. I, I'd like to actually pick up on, on the question that the moderator posed, which is really what, uh, in what instances has the CFA been effective uh, in its intended application, and is there a mechanism already in place whereby the uh, regulation that the CFA intends to enforce gets updated just by a matter of course of the evolution in the technology. I mean, this sounds to me like a very natural process and I don't understand what the resistance to it would be. And I'm not really talking about the enforcement arm, the Department of Justice enforcement arm, but from a legislative perspective, isn't there a mechanism whereby these laws get updated to current technology standards and requirements? There, there's no process for the automatic revision of laws where we say, okay, every five years, you know, technology's changed or something. I saw somebody tweet, like, if the law's 10 years old and it's about the Internet, it's already defunct. We don't have any process for that. And, and we try, the way we try to handle that is to not make the laws technology specific in the for in the first place, but of course technology always sort of thwarts that and outpaces us. And so the, the, what we're supposed to do there is we're supposed to go back to Congress and to um, revise the laws in, in light of that. Um, from my perspective, and I may be more conservative here than other people, I do think that the CFAA has been useful in protecting computers. For example, I think it's very useful when it comes to denial of service attacks. There is a provision in the CFAA that deals with that. Um, you're not allowed to uh, send commands or codes that interfere with the availability of the server. Um, it's not super, um, that part of it's not super ambiguous. The ambiguity there is in the definition of harm or loss, but I think that's much easier to remedy. Um, I think it's, it's valuable there. Um, and I think that, you know, from my perspective as well, the CFAA is often a valuable tool in protecting information that our society does not uh, adequately protect most explicitly private information. Um, and I'll tell a story about this that I think really um, symbolizes just the tension here in the problem. And I had a, uh, this case happened I think in 2006, the guy's name was Eric McCarty, and he was an applicant to, I believe it was USC. And he had submitted his application materials, and then he um, was looking at the website, and he saw that through easy manipulation of the URL, he could pull out his own data, his own application data, from the website, which, you know, his, his test scores, like all that stuff. And he went to the press with that, and uh, they said, well, you know, that's your data, you could have got that, you know, how do we know you got it from there? So he went back to the website and started pulling out other people's data. And he ended up getting um, charged with CFAA violation for doing that. I mean, this story to me symbolizes so much of what's hard about the CFAA. First it was his data, he was testing the server, it was in the service of everybody else's private information. The, the hack wasn't, or maybe it was a, maybe it was SQL injection, I think that's right, it was SQL injection attack. The hack was sort of known, but he tricked the server into giving him information out of the whole database. His intention in this particular case might have been just to inform the press, but it could have been, he could have done the exact same thing, and his intention was to get the private information of all the people who had applied to USC that term. 
So that information is not protected. It's not copyrighted. There's not a statute really that protects that data or anything. How do we protect that data? How do we protect that privacy? And yet also allow um, some amount of tinkering or exploration and also allow, not scare people away from reporting it when they do find problems like that. And I think that's a really hard question. I think that's a really hard line to draw, and I don't know how to draw that line. So, so, so yes, I think this, there is value in the CFAA, um, but I think that it is um, some of the reasons why it's, it's overbroad are technological, and a lot of the reasons why it's overbroad are legal. I think we can fix the legal problems. I think we're going to need experience and time to figure out, um, you know, sort of how the technology evolves our understanding of what's appropriate or not appropriate needs to evolve as well. So I want to take a question from online now. Uh, someone asked um, uh, whether, um, so someone asked uh, whether it would be uh, okay to go in a direction for a form, as has been proposed by uh, some, drawing a line at something like effective technical countermeasures. Very funny. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, drawing a line at uh, effective technical countermeasures. Um, so if we recognize that there are uh, some protections that people should be able to work on, uh, perhaps uh, we'll, we'll ratchet that line up a little bit. Uh, does that direction seem promising to the uh, tech experts who are participating, or, or does that line seem pretty undrawable? I think that uh, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that there should be some sort of minimum bar of uh, effectiveness of a technical measure before it can even be considered uh, any sort of a trespass or accessing a computer without authorization. Um, I think that there are a, a ton of very lightweight uh, kind of access, uh, default access suggestions, I guess you could say, that people use. For example, uh, a user agent will say, hey, I'm using this browser, but if you change, if you spoof your user agent, in a sense, you're, you know, accessing a, a, you're getting around this access control. But I think it's such a trivial access control that isn't taken seriously by computer scientists that it shouldn't be considered such. So I'm sympathetic to the idea of a, a minimum uh, bar for how effective a technological measure has to be. I think it's tough to define, but I, I think going that direction is promising. Uh, Alex or Ed, did you have anything you wanted to note on this before we move to the next question? Oh, I, I, um, I, yes. Sorry, Bruce. Oh, okay. Uh, so, from my standpoint as a researcher, um, I often find myself asking the question of how well a particular measure works. And often the question we're asking in our research is, is it effective? Is it strong? How easy is it to uh, And so, something which draws the legal line based on the answer to the question that we don't know yet doesn't really help us that much as researchers. Uh, and I've found that these sorts of lines can be tough to draw. If you look at the way the uh, effective measure language in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act has functioned, uh, measures that are very weak have been treated as effective. And so you end up not with, without as much protection as you ought to have. Thanks. Yeah, from my perspective, I would say that any, if I break into something and I defeated a measure that by definition is not effective, I'm not sure how you get rid of the tautology of uh, if I violate this CFA, therefore I didn't. Um, so I, I wouldn't support any effectiveness other than ones that are specifically called out for privacy purposes. I think the ones about um, no, you know, if it's a protection that also keeps me from doing something like keeping my own privacy by changing my MAC address, by uh, accessing from a different IP address that doesn't necessarily belong to me. Um, in any situation like that, uh, that's both not effective and privacy violating, that those should be called out specifically. Uh, but in general, um, I think the effective line would be way too fuzzy, just like Ed said at the MTA, uh, for it to be used. Thanks. Uh, Brewster, did you want to say something? No. 
I, I find the idea of, of, of bulk downloading in and of itself being a crime to be the wrong place to start. Um, that the idea of, uh, it may be what it is you do afterwards. If you may, it might be something that you'd go and bulk download if it's all copyrighted materials and then you go and start selling it. That might be a problem. Um, but the idea of going and gathering these materials is sort of setting a gate too far up the road. Um, that we need to be able to have some slack in the system for getting uh, things done that we want to get done. Um, and I, this sort of setting the, all of the traps right at the door um, will cause enormous problems. Even copyright has got fair use exemptions, um, saying it's okay to copy as long as, you know, these things. Um, I think we need the same kind of walking through websites uh, and, and data and data sets um, for certain sets of purposes is, I think, we, we should be encouraging this uh, and not discouraging it, and especially not making it criminal. Thanks. Uh, back to the audience. Okay, I, I'm not a lawyer. Can I just ask, for this audience, has anybody here pursued a CFAA against somebody? Okay. And what, what was that about? Well, I, as a moderator, I would greatly okay, prefer okay, that we so, not bring so, in individual right, okay. cases from the let, audience. Let, let, me, let me put it there. And, and so, without getting into has anybody been accused of a CFAA? Okay. We got one. All right. So, 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 so I'm someone, I'm not going to go into the case. Well, I, someone hacked my system back when I was running a company and, um, you know, I ended up hiring them rather than firing them. And, uh, you know, they actually turned out to be a pretty good coder and they lived with me for a long time and uh, they did some other hacking and that guy was Jack Dorsey and he went on to start Twitter and now Square. Um, I learned a lot from him. I, I'm currently now up on a CFAA and I don't mean to get into it, but I'm sort of curious at a meeting like this that there aren't more people here like me that are coming that are under a CFAA threat. Um, and I didn't know Aaron Schwartz. I feel bad that I didn't know Aaron Schwartz because he's actually up for the same things that I'm up for, both on the CFAA and on copyright. And I didn't know him and he didn't know me. And I think a lot of the folks that are in the CFAA trouble we don't know each other because a lot of times our, toy, our lawyers are telling us not to talk to each other, not to talk to X, Y, and Z. And so we're a very isolated community. So I just want to put my hand up and, and sort of say how that feels. And, and I've been on the other side, like, like you have someone who has had systems that have been hacked and had to deal with, with the threats on the other side. And so it is an isolating experience. And so the thing that's problematic for me and gets me a little bit mm, stirred up at a meeting like this is, like if Aaron was here today, I'd like to ask him really more about like, hey, why were you doing it? Like, like not why, the little why, but why the big why? And, and like when Jack hacked me and all these things, usually people that are doing these things, they're, you know, the bad hackers and they're good hackers. And so one of the things that I just feel that's been completely lost in a lot of these dialogues and like, I, we talked about the MIT thing. Like, I don't understand why like MIT isn't like Can, can you please ask a right question? Now. Sorry? Could, could you please ask a question? So my question is, why isn't there more heat on folks like MIT that had this culture and now seems to have gone totally over to the other side? And why isn't there more heat from an organization like Stanford on MIT? Because the thing that seems to be getting lost in this is the whys. And that's what I'm searching for. And when I come to a forum like this, I'm hearing more about the legal side as opposed to really the substantive issues as to the, the whys that people are taking these risks in the first place. So, so I'm, I'm curious as to why there isn't more heat on MIT in particular about this situation, given what their culture was and what their culture has become. Um, I, I think there is a lot of heat on MIT. 
they had to appoint someone, a, a very well-respected man, to um, do an investigation into their role in the um, prosecution. And to MIT's credit, they appointed him within two days of Aaron's suicide, and he is doing an investigation. And I expect that that investigation will be thorough um, and, and revealing, and I think that they um, will have a lot of soul-searching about it. I think your question pointed to another thing I want to say just as a lawyer, which is um, in the law we often think about, or morally we often think about motive, and then in the law we often have intent. And um, first I'll say that motive doesn't have any place in whether you're guilty or not guilty. Why you did it doesn't matter. You stole the loaf of bread because you're hungry, or you stole the loaf of bread because you just don't like that store owner, it doesn't matter. Um, but even intent doesn't really save us that much in, these ter in this area because intent is very, um, very um, in the mind of the beholder. Did you do it intentionally or whatever, which is the, the standard in the CFA, it means did you mean to do the act that you did as opposed to being uh, incapacitated or something like that? And what we found in this area is when we're looking at motive or how you deal with people or who's good or who's not good, that there really is a, a cultural divide. Um, you know, as uh, Larry Lessig said, today in his speech about, uh, about Aaron, he said, you know, the more that the Department of Justice, the more the prosecutors learned about Aaron, the harder they were on him. And I've seen the people whose reaction to stuff that Aaron's written online, um, you know, things that I think of as like showing a kind of um, wonderful idealism about sharing information and about making information accessible to people all around the world were the very reasons people felt like what he did was criminal, that he knew what he was doing was wrong um, and that he meant to break the law anyway because of his ideology. And so it's, it's a terrible way to have to defend a case as a lawyer. It's a horrible thing for your defense to have to hinge on as a defendant. And as a civil litigant, um, intent is really just not something that you can resolve on a motion to dismiss stage. So it's unbelievably expensive. To, to prove yourself innocent there. So it's very hard. So I think it, it, the law is really ill suited. Um, once you have a broad law, it's very ill suited to make discriminations based on these kinds of, uh, these kinds of value judgments about you know, who's a good hacker and who's a bad hacker and that kind of thing. Thanks. Um, so we're winding down on time. I'm going to take uh, two, two more uh, full questions and then uh, we'll try to go through the remainder of the queue in lightning mode. Uh, just for reactions from the speakers. And of course, uh, you'll be able to, to come up afterwards um, if, if you have other thoughts you'd like to share. So let's start over here. Um, does this work? All right. My name is Lauren. I'm a 1L at the University of San Francisco School of Law. Um, I have kind of a broader question. Um, given that we have family law courts and juvenile courts, and there have been courts in Delaware and Texas and California that have kind of embraced being patent law courts, how realistic do you think it is to have like cyberspace courts or courts that are dealing with crimes happening in cyberspace where we'd actually have computer experts rather than judges who are just reading briefs and given the facts that we're giving them to work with? Uh, I don't know. It's an interesting idea. Um, I'd like to think about it. My initial instinct is that when we look at our specialty courts, we don't actually see that the judgments coming out of those are any fairer. Um, then we do otherwise, you know, do I rather be in front of the, the pat courts that just do patent cases or, or that sort of thing? But um, I'd, I'll, I'd like to think about it further. I also think technology is going to be kind of more and more interwoven in our society in a way that aspects of cases might have a technological component, but it, it'll be difficult to cleanly separate uh, a case that is a computer case from, a, from another one. Thanks. Uh, let's do the last full question here before going into lightning round. All right, thanks. This is Pete Stevenson, double E, PhD student at Stanford, and thanks for hosting this event. I certainly learned a great amount, and perhaps I'm not as casually related to the topic as I thought. And as a kind of innocent bystander, I read that my emails stored in the cloud could be wiretapped, so to speak, by the government without a warrant from a judge, and I don't understand this. It doesn't make sense to me. And this is based on a law, an ancient law now, where if the email was on my machine, then they would need to get a warrant, but since it's on the cloud, they don't. And I think this points a, points a finger at this kind of truism that the law is lagging technology, and as I think about technology, I'm thinking about devices that let the blind people see, as reported in the New York Times, drones that are going to be, you know, privately owned, 
I could be a hobbyist and have a quadricopter and have a camera on the quadricopter and Google Street View could catch somebody breaking the law and that would be on the internet and nobody knew that. And I guess the, the gener generic question I'm asking is how do we get the law, how do you, you know, CFAA is not just the only game in town here and it's, it's so woefully lagging. Can we do any forward-looking thought? And, um, and the only weak idea I came up with is, you know, the right to free speech seemed like a pretty forward-looking thought and it's been protecting the citizens of this country for a long time. Are there some rights we could grant or, or something like that? How do we get forward-looking? Well, I think passing a constitutional amendment would be tough. Yes, but, uh, <laughs> well, I'm granted, I'm sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a problem. You know, the, the, the law you mentioned, the Stored Communications Act, is part of the uh, a, a broader set of privacy laws um, that haven't been updated since the 80s. And the CFA as well, you know, most of it was drafted in the 80s. And, and technology does outpace these laws. And there's kind of a fundamental assumption among, in the policy world and the legislative world, that we should draft laws to be broadly broad enough so that when technology changes, they're still applicable. I think that's a good principle to go by, but I also think it's, it might be valuable to, to question that a little bit and really understand the trade-offs we're making because if we make a law too general, then we end up in a situation like this with the CFA where it's very vague and uh, there, we suffer as a result. So I think it's good to, to push back on the assumption of generality a little bit when drafting these laws and also to you know, update them more frequently. That would be great. Thanks. Uh, so the game plan now is to process everyone remaining in the queue very briefly, ask the question, and then uh, we'll, we'll, ask this, we'll have the speakers uh, try to respond to as much as they can. I, I recognize this is not uh, the ideal format, but recognizing time limitations as they are, we'd like to address as much as possible. So let's start by processing the queue on the left, and then by processing the queue on the right. Um, what is the CFA's equivalent in other countries, and are any of them formulated in a more reasonable way? Um, actually, very related to that, um, as, you know, as non-American or non-U.S. citizens, what can we do to help? And also, given that this is law that will naturally apply to non-U.S. citizens and also people that live actively in other countries, uh, how do you plan dealing with that? Uh, where does free speech fall into port scanning and URL fuzzing? Can you tell us a bit about uh, CFAA with respect to web scraping, data mining, uh, especially with respect to commercial free speech and uh, commercial offers like uh, my, my house, I'm renting a house for $1,000 a month or a job opening and what it pays and using that information to create derivative works. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how you see the, the law currently? The last question. I see a lot of terms of service agreements that say they reserve the right to update the agreement at any time. What's the enforceability of that, and is there any analog in the real world? Thanks. Okay, who would like to go first? <laughs> what? Seems like there are a lot okay. of legal questions. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I am not uh, particularly familiar with computer crime laws in other countries. The only one I've ever dealt with before is Germany. And it does have some, if I remember correctly, it does have some sense of a circumvention of a technological measure or some aspect of it to it. So that's a great idea that maybe we should look to some other countries and see how they've, uh, how they've phrased it and then take a look at their case law and see how they may have been dealing with the same problem. And then we can take that information back to, um, back to the Congress here. And whether you're an American citizen or you're not, one of the ways that you can really help is to share your stories and share your ideas as we try to work through this problem. Um, things that you want to do that you think are cool that might be um, in trouble with the CFA, problems you've had where you thought somebody should be prosecuted and what happened there and define why it was you thought that they should be prosecuted. Anything, you know, when we do open letters from technologists to Congress explaining to them what the problem is, you can sign on to those letters. You don't have to be an American citizen for those stories and anecdotes to be, to be useful. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in terms of where we are now, one of the biggest communities that we think should be helpful in CFAA reform is the startup repurposer 
repurposers of information that's currently out there. Data miners, web scrapers, um, aggregators, uh, those sorts of people. These are, these are services that are taking existing information, whether it be journal articles or housing prices or whatever it is, and making it into a format that's more useful for people that's a valuable service. And I think we really want to do that, but right now almost all that stuff in at least the 5th, 7th, and 11th circuits and maybe in other places is, is illegal because of the terms of service. Now, as a matter of contract law, saying I've got a contract and I'm going to change it later, that's not um, enforceable at all. But as a matter of licensing law, those things can be enforceable and it can change your right to use the website in the future. So the question is, what is the terms of service? Is it a contract? Is it a license to use the data that's on the service? Or is it basically the terms that define criminal and non-criminal behavior? So the answer to that question really depends on how the law, view, the law views terms of service. I think I answered them all. Nicely done. <laughs> Very good. Um, does anyone else have any uh, thoughts they'd like to share before we wrap up? Uh, I just have one. Oh. I will put on our website those questions that I asked, and I will be expecting a short essay from every one of you who's here <laughs> with your thoughts and answers to those questions. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, yeah, <clears throat> Not being the lawyer, um, I, I find um, what I understand of these laws to span from confusing to insane. Um, and by being a technologist, by being a librarian, um, what I try to find is, is a, as a guiding principle is do the right thing. So be a good librarian if you're a librarian. Be a good citizen if you're a citizen. We're trying to build the future we want to live in. Laws follow. They don't tend to lead. Whenever they've tried to lead and go and say, oh, I don't know what the future is going to be. Let's put a law in place for it. They've screwed it up completely. Um, so I think that at least those of us outside of the law domain, um, we have a responsibility to sort of do kind of the right thing and build uh, this world that we actually want. And thank you to the lawyers that are helping, in some sense, catch up to the technology that a lot of us are building. Thanks. Editor Alex, any last words? No is a perfectly okay response. <laughs> Oh, all right. So, what was that? Was that going at? All right. Was that, was that going to Go ahead, yes. Okay. Then, then thank you all for coming. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, I know you stayed late. So I get it. Uh, at least some of us will be around up here if you have further uh, questions. And of course, you can always find us online on the Stanford uh, CIS website. Thanks a lot.